Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Harvard Classics lectures. We turn now in Harvard Classic volume number 17, Folklore, Fable, um, the, the, uh, the work of actually three collections of stories. This is lecture number 79. And uh, we'll be talking a lot about the notion of folklore and why it's so important. Remember that we began with a mantra that we continue to kind of talk about over and over again in our conversations. We are in many ways, fundamentally, the stories we tell, the stories we retell. We're going to talk about why that's important, a story that gets told again and again and again. We are the stories we accept, but we're also the stories that we reject over time. There's going to be a few of these stories that we're going to say, oh yeah, I know that one, and then we're going to say, oh yeah, dude, I've never, I, I, I've heard a different version of Cinderella, nothing about birds poking out eyes at the end of the Disney version. We'll talk more about it in a little bit. Of course, the key here is why are we the stories that we retell? Because they remind us, as we have said many times before, of who we are, or maybe importantly for your notes, who we used to be. Notice how we are always saying this when we're studying things like the great epic poems. Now, if you haven't been following our stuff, hit learnstrong.net, go to the Harvard Classics Lectures. We've worked through now 78 different lectures. Lecture 77 was the uh, Thousand and One Nights, the Arabian Nights, and then Lecture 78, the one that we just did from Volume 17 is the Aesop's Fables. What we're trying to now do in Harvard Classics is to pull away from some of the more philosophic uh, treatises and to spend some specific time with important stories. Now, it's interesting that Grimm's brothers fairy tales are often called children's stories, but when we get into them, we recognize that very regularly, these are actually not stories so easily for children until they have somehow been maybe a little, little massaged or whatever. Just to remind our learning theory is the uh, goal to always create, uh, relate new information to old information in meaningful ways, and this is significant for us in this discussion. Our three levels of reading, we always want to introduce and remind. Level one, what does the text say? Summary. Level two, what does the text mean? Here at 2A, themes, messages. At 2B, we're always talking about symbolism, about rhetoric, and here we'll be concentrating on symbolism, archetypes. We're going to see lots of old women who are usually like witches, or they're really, they're really um, great sources of wisdom. We're going to see the king motif. Of course, if you're familiar with Jungian psychology, we're going to see a whole lot of this. Finally, at level three, how can I relate to this text in some meaningful way at 3A, other texts, other titles, all the childhood stories that we grew up with. If Plato is right in Republic, we debate that in another, another set of lectures, of course, but if Plato is right, then we are in many ways the stories we were told when we were very young in our formative years. That is to say, our moral development, our ethical development, our, our understanding of right and wrong in large measure came through the presentation and the study uh, and, the, and the appreciation of stories in our childhood. What were those stories? Many of them were Grimm's uh, brother's stories. Okay, We're also, of course, in each of the stories that we look at, and I, I'm only going to have a few minutes to look at a few of these stories, sadly. Uh, but We'll be paying attention as we do with, for example, our study of epics, to make sure that we're looking at at least three, maybe four, maybe even five different dimensions. For example, we'll ask always about epistemological, that is to say, what it is that we can know. In some of these stories, this is hypercritical. There's stuff that children can't know because they're young, they're innocent, and then, of course, they come to know it. And that is to say, these stories become what we will call later a propedeutic instructional. There is the ontological question of who we are, and fundamentally this will be a huge part of a lot of these stories. There will be, of course, the psychological. We mentioned Jung already. Freud had a lot to say as well about some of these stories, and they're like... And then finally, the sociological reading, the political reading. There's going to be another one, and I'm really going to challenge you guys to think about this one. When we look at the tales that we're going to look at, there's also the theodicy question. Why is it that terrible things happen? to people who often seem to not deserve it, especially if you believe in an all-powerful and an all-loving deity. Go back to our lectures on Milton and especially Paradise Lost in Harvard Classics lectures and remember that this is one of those central questions for Milton to justify the ways of God to men. I'm going to argue that a whole lot of what's actually going on in Cinderella, in Little Red Riding Hood, as it's uh, going to be have, to, have been translated for most of you when you were children, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be asking this question, why is it bad stuff happens? We're going to find regularly in these stories, a lot of the blame is going to be placed on individuals who make the wrong choices. To that degree, it's going to sound a whole lot like what Homer has Zeus say at the beginning of Odyssey in Book One. Go back and take a look at our lecture on Odyssey um, and, and kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. Let's do a real quick biography of Brothers Grimm. 
We have Jacob or Jakob, um, um, uh, uh, Ludwig Karl, who's born 1785 to 1863, and then his brother, Wilhelm Karl, who was born 1786 to 1859. They're German academics, philologists, put that in your notes. This is what makes them so important in the academic community. Researchers of culture, and the, especially the German language, and great collectors of stories. Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, um, Snow White, all of these famous, what we sometimes call Disney stories, all originate here. Children's and Household Tales is actually the original title, published in two volumes, the first one in 1812, the second in 1815, uh, and, and, um, and when, uh, there's seven printings of these, of these things, finally culminating in 1857. Hey, just note the date of 1800. We like to give that often as just a round date for the rise of Romanticism. Think about that. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is 1818. Gutes Faust, the text that we will uh, that we have spoken of many times in 303, 1806. So that gives you kind of a sense of that of the time period. They are born in Germany, but they lose their father early on, and they have to live in poverty. I think that informs a lot of what goes on in the Brothers Grimm story. They end up at the University of Marburg, where they begin researching German tales and especially German language. They, in many ways, they didn't invent folk tales, but they invented folk tale studies. In other words, these are not just dumb stories. These are really important stories, they, they were convinced. The seventh edition of 1857 started with 156 stories um, and ended with over 200. We only have 41 in our Harvard's Classics, volume number 17, and I'm only going to be able to work with a handful, and I'm sad about that. I wish I could spend more time with you guys doing that. What I hope is what I've often said with these Harvard Classics lectures. I hope that once you've heard a little bit, you maybe go out and get your own copy and take a look at it. By 1838, they began work on their prodigious historical German dictionary, which unfortunately never was finished. Uh, anyone who studies language at all and loves the study of language, either German or any other language, is going to be just blown away by the work these guys did, these brothers did. Um, th there's, a, there's a famous and obviously infamous history that is attended to these grim stories. You can even hear in the word grim meaning kind of like, it's kind of whoa, rough, and the, and the word grims itself, there's been a connection that's often been made. It's, it's, it's a tangential connection. I mean, the word grim came before the Grimm brothers. But there is an easy way to remember their name that way. Disney, of course, we've mentioned, but even somebody as disgusting as Adolf Hitler played around as, uh, with these stories. And then even reading somebody like Nietzsche and thus spoke Zarathustra, there are, there, are, there are kind of you know, resonances, we might say, to these kinds of stories. Uh, the original stories were surprisingly cruel and violent, incredibly violent. And they were actually filled with quite a bit of sex. They are polarized. This is sometimes the word that's used. That is to say that a lot of that stuff was removed as they got ready to start to share some of this stuff with children. The brothers were interested in religion and stories and the role of religion, especially Wilhelm especially. Um, and some of the stories are written, no doubt, as warnings. That is to say, propedeutics for children. Little Ed Riding Hood comes to mind. Hansel and Gretel, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them. There are lots of spinning stories. Those of us who love our Iliad and our Odyssey will appreciate this one. There are lots of spinning stories in, 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 in the Grimm. I've already mentioned theodicy. I think this is a key. I think when you read the Grimm stories, this is where you really have to camp. That is to say that question. Why is it the case that children, especially children, have to suffer in such a, in, in, in such a world as we live in? And I think there's some answers to that one that we're, gonna, that we're going to... Um, you know, talk about, again, often brought on by human actions, especially, as we said, the opening lines for Zeus, who says, you'll remember the opening lines of the Odyssey, it's not, our, it's not the God's fault. Humans make these choices, these decisions, not our fault. Well, let's enjoy a few of these stories and appreciate the power of a great story. And let's as well consider the importance of fairy tales for children, both in terms of their moral development as well as their own identity. I mean, there's been all kinds of scholarship about this. I mean, you can take a look at this. And the idea that stories that are, that are told to children are designed intentionally to kind of create some understanding of moral development and the like. So let's go to work. I'm only going to work with a handful of stories. I'll work for as long as I got time. I'm sorry, I, I, you know, and I, and I wish I could read a whole bunch of this with you. I'll try and look a little bit at it. We're going to begin with what's often uh, referred to as the Frog King, or sometimes known as Iron Henry. An, an amazing little story. You have a young girl. She's a princess. She's playing with a gold ball, and she loses her ball in the well. And she's lamenting that she has lost her ball. A whole lot made in the literature about what this gold ball can symbolize, but then we can say that about almost every object in every one of these stories. 
all of a sudden there's this disgusting frog there. The frog will answer, um, you know, I'll help you if you promise that you'll love me. And she goes, fine, 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 just give me the, you know, give me the, uh, give me the ball. And so she does get the ball. And then he says, take me with you, take me with you. And she just runs away. There's a knock at the door later, and guess what? There's the frog. She doesn't want to have anything to do with the quote-unquote dis disgusting frog. But we do have this interesting moment when Daddy King turns around and he will say, that which, quote, there's a quote here, that which thou hast promised must thou perform. Right? Go and let the frog in. And let the frog into your bedroom. Let the frog into your bed. This kind of thing. Well, she's, she just she can't do it. The frog is too disgusting. And so she picks the frog up angrily as she's getting ready for bed. And she throws the frog against the wall. And the minute that the frog hits the wall, the frog is no frog, but a king's son with a beautiful, kind set of eyes. <laughs> now, this is the interesting part of our story. The young girl is not punished for treating the frog badly because it's a stupid frog. And the minute she throws it against the wall, the frog turns into a young prince. We're going to see this transformation stuff a lot. It's going to remind us a lot of Ovid's metamorphoses. We've commented elsewhere on this one. That idea of transformation. Where does Kafka's metamorphosis, that whole notion of Gregory open, uh, opening his eyes that morning and waking up as a beetle, a lot of those transformations are, 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 born, are born right here. We're going we're gonna to see more of this as we go through this. Of course, they become a thing. This is always the way that most of these happy stories, and they're not all happy endings, but most of them do have somewhat of a happy ending. And this is one of those where, of course, they become, they become uh, husband and wife. On their way back to the to the young the young prince's castle, they they catch up with faithful Henry as he's referred to. Faithful Henry quote had been so unhappy when his master was changed into a frog that he had caused three iron bands to be laid around his heart lest it should burst with grief and sadness. When finally. He, he meets up again with his master. He is so unbelievably happy. Um, and and uh, the prince says, are you happy about the carriage that we're in? And he says, no, no, no. He says, I'm happy, quote, it's a band from my heart which was put there in my great pain when you were a frog and imprisoned in the well. Now it's lifted. That is to say, ultimate friendship. Now this is an interesting little story for a number of reasons, of course. It talks a lot about the loss of innocence or the, the requirement of growing up. It talks a lot about keeping one's promises. It talks a lot about the expectations being somehow changed or altered. And then, interestingly, true friendship. The idea that a young, uh, that a young man turned into a frog did not lose the friend that longed for him all the time. We think of St. Augustine in Confessions and the way that his friend and the passing of his friend caused him such grief. The next uh, story that I want to give to you is called the, the Wolf and the Seven Little Kids. And it's a, it's a, it's a strange uh, story. Several of you have been reading this with me and you have said out loud that you're kind of surprised at the kind of gratuitous violence. Some of you are saying, well, I remember some of these parts of stories in storybooks that were read to me, but I didn't, they weren't labeled as grim stories. They were just other stories that were reading. The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids, three-part story. Part one, the mother has little children, goats, and kids, and she tells them, I'm going away, but beware of the wolf. Now, the wolf, of course, symbolic in most of these stories of being something that's not just dangerous, but something that's really crafty and wise. The fox is sometimes as well mentioned in this regards as well as the wolf. The wolf, of course, is going to show up while the mother is away, and because of his rough voice, and the children have been forewarned about the rough voice, and, of course, the paws, the black paws, the wolf is sent away because of his voice. He will change his voice by swallowing some materials that will change his voice, make it softer. He'll come back, but again, there's threes all the way through this. The second time he comes back, the kids will recognize because of his paws. He will go, he will have his paws covered with, uh, with, with some material, and, it, and, and then come back for a third time. Third time it works, he eats all the kids save one of the seven. We're told that the mother then shows up. And at length in her grief, after she hears from the youngest and or from the one kid that's remaining what has happened and that the wolf has eaten all of her children. In her grief, she went out and the youngest kid ran with her. And when they came to the meadow, they lay the wolf by a tree. In other words, he eats the children and then just goes out and, and lays under a tree. So loud that the branches shook. She looked at him and on every side and saw that something was moving and struggling in his gorged body. Ah, oh, heaven, said she, is it possible that my poor children, whom he has swallowed down for his supper, can still be alive? In, a, in other words, the, the, the wolf is greedy and just, com and, and just completely swallows them whole, which is 
going to allow for them to be saved, obviously. The kid runs down um, back. He fetches scissors and a needle. She will cut open the stomach. See, these are interesting stories because the wolf just continues to sleep. She'll cut open the stomach. She'll pull out all of her children. She'll tell them all to go and get rocks. They get rocks. They bring them back. They put them back inside the stomach of the wolf. She sews it back. And this will be, of course, the reason why in the end that the wolf will go down, fall into the water, and drown. In other words, the wolf, the greedy wolf, will himself get what is coming to him. Now notice, this theodicy question of why it is that children get eaten, they didn't listen to their mother or pay close attention to their mother. Why does the wolf in the end um, 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 die? Because, of course, he was greedy and he allowed, and he just swallowed them whole, which allowed for them to be, re, you know, almost like reborn or, re, or, or, or resurrected out of the stomach of the wolf, and then ultimately the stones will sink the wolf. So you can see some of the instructional material here as well. Let's jump now to maybe, I mean, it's hard to argue, which is the most famous of the Grimm stories, but maybe certainly one of them is Hansel and Gretel. Certainly, uh, um, you're right, I see some of you already smiling. Some of you already know this story. It is an interesting story, and it has some parts in it that maybe even if you were told it as a child, you didn't get all the parts. I love the opening lines of the story so much because it resurrects some really debatable kinds of points that was just reading. The opening word in this translation is the word hard. And it makes sense, given the story. Hard by a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel the girl Gretel. He had little to bite and to break. And once, when great scarcity fell on the land, he could no longer procure daily bread. Let's put it in our notes. This is one of the important elements of Grimm's brothers. The idea of poverty. Suffering comes with poverty. Not having something to eat. And, of course, having children. We think of that famous scene in Dickens' Christmas Carol where uh, the, the, um, the, the, um, um, the, the ghost of Christmas present will move back his cloak and standing under there are those two poor children which, you know, want, you know, to describe the, the, the notion of wanting, grieving, and poverty, right? And when he had thought um, uh, over this uh, by night in his bed and tossed about in his anxiety, he groaned and said to his wife, quote, What is to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children when we no longer have anything even for ourselves? End quote. I'll tell you what, husband, answered the woman. And this is interesting. Often it's the woman in the stories that is the bad person, okay, that gives the bad advice. I'll tell you what, husband, early tomorrow morning we'll take the children out into the forest where it's thickest, there we'll light a fire for them and give them each one piece of bread, and then we'll go to our work and leave them alone. They're going to abandon them because they can't feed them. Okay? Well, the way this story works is that Hansel, the young man, will have heard this plan. He will then pick up pebbles on his way and drop them, and that will allow them for the first day to come back. The second day, he will do, uh, the same, will do the same gig again, only this time he's going to drop breadcrumbs, the famous dropping of breadcrumbs. Of course, the problem here is that the birds will pick up the breadcrumbs, and in the process of picking up the breadcrumbs, the children will have no way to get back home. Instead, they will find themselves in the middle of the woods, all alone, looking at an interesting kind of structure. This structure is a house, right? Um, and, and so um, they walk up to the house, they will, um, 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 at, at the house, they will find this gingerbread house, of course, as it is, covered with cakes, the windows clear sugar, and, of course, a very, very old woman. Again, another motif, the old woman who is, in fact, a witch. She says to them, come on in, no harm will happen to you. The, only, the old woman, I'm reading now, the old woman only pretended to be kind. She was, in reality, a wicked witch. Uh, stranger danger is the way one or two of you have said this out loud. The Grimm brothers uh, wanted to say to children, stranger danger, be careful, be, be aware. For those of you that know the film Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Roll, old story that was turned into a movie many, many years ago. Some of you smiling because you know it, even though it's an old, old film. Um, it's, the, it's the child catcher, isn't it, right, who will catch the children with candy. Um, She's a wicked witch who lay in wait for children and had only built a little bread house in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked it, and ate it. And that was a feast day with her. And then we're told that in the side, witches have, we think of our Macbeth and the opening lines of fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air are, are witches there. Witches have red eyes and cannot see far, but they have a keen scent like the beasts and are aware when human beings draw near. Okay, so very animalistic kind of thing. Well, 
the woman, of course, is going to say, uh, we're going to separate the two children. We're going to keep Hans out there. We're going to feed him so that we can fatten him up so we can eat him. And then it's time, finally, to bake the, to bake the children. And she, the, the woman, will, the witch, will tell the young girl, Gretel, creep in and see into the oven. Creep in and see if it's properly heated so that we can shut the bread in. Gretel will pretend as if she doesn't know how to do it. The old woman will, of course, show her how to do it, and in the process, um, um, uh, Gretel will, will push her in. Um, that's, that's the first part of the story, the, set, the, the, or the, the middle part of the story. The end of the story is interesting as well. A white duck, a whole lot's been made of the colors and the symbolism of colors. The white duck will help them across the pond, both one at a time, and ultimately they show up. In the meantime, the wicked mother has died, and we're told at the end of the story, the man had not known one happy hour since he'd left the children in the forest. Woman, however, was dead. Gretel emptied her pinafore until pearls and precious stones ran about the room, and Gretel and Hansel threw one handful after another out of his pocket to add to them. So in other words, now all of a sudden they have, uh, they have found all this diamonds and jewelry from the witch's house. And then all anxiety was at an end, and they lived together in perfect happiness. This is the way a lot of these stories end. That's why I'm reading it to you. My tale is done. The, the, the story will end. Uh, there runs a mouse. Whosoever catches it may make himself a big fur cap out of it. It's a fun, a fun ch a way for the uh, story to end. If Hansel and Gretel is not the most famous of the stories, then maybe Cinderella is. So let's turn to that one. A story that, of course, most of you know well. Disney's taught it to us well, along with, of course, um, um, the Sleeping Beauty and a few other stories that I'm not going to be able to get into. The beginning of the story, Cinderella, uh, and Cinder, of are related to embers and a fire, and more particularly the fireplace itself is the origin of Cinderella, begins again with a woman who will have married a man. And this is, this is often the case where children, or a child, in this case Cinderella, is put in a very difficult situation. We think of Hamlet, his lines from Act 1, Scene 2, Break My Heart, 